Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve continues his inspiring series called Encountering the Real Jesus. What lessons can we learn from Jesus calming the storm? Discover the power of the Savior in life's struggles with today's message called When the Storms Meet the Savior. If you have your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I wanted to speak to you this morning when the storms meet the Savior. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. The scripture says, And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with them. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Life is filled with storms. It's filled with problems and difficulties, and as a friend of mine once said, life can be summed up in three phases. You're either uh, entering a storm, in a storm, or just got out of a storm to enter into another storm. Life is filled with difficulties and problems and storms. Job chapter 5 verse 7 says, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. And the thing about troubles and problems and difficulties and storms, they can hit you when you least expect it, just as they hit the disciples that night on the Sea of Galilee. They weren't expecting a storm. It just arose. You know, you can be having a little pain and think it's not a whole lot of anything, maybe reflux, maybe a gallbladder, you go to the doctor and you find out you have stage three cancer. You know, you can get in your car after a day at work, just gonna drive home, just routine like you always do, but then this time you get hit head on by a drunk driver. You can get a phone call, the phone rings just like it always does, but this time it's a family member that says there's been a crisis and our loved one is gone. Life can change just like that. And it's unwanted and it can be unexpected and it can throw you in tremendous turmoil. And then the question comes, well, what do I do now? What do I do with this? How can I handle this? We're in a series called Encountering the Real Jesus, and today we want to see what happens when the real Jesus meets your storm and the storm meets him, because the real Jesus is the one who can do anything. Now, in our text today, it's a very, very important text, not that uh, some texts aren't important. It's all the Word of God. But any time that you have a text that's included in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, it's as if God is saying, now pay special attention to this because this is really important. That's why I've included it three times in my Word. 
And I don't believe anyone is here by accident. I think that God has brought us here today to speak to our hearts through the music and through this message when the storms meet the Savior. And no doubt, there are many in this room and you are experiencing a storm right now. And you are maybe feeling like the disciples, thinking that you're about to go under because of this financial problem, because of this marriage problem, because of this physical problem. And you're crying out, what do I do now? I want to share with you four things that you can do, and you can start them today that makes a huge difference in whatever storm you are facing. First thing you can do, you can trust in the Lord's word. You can trust in the Lord's word. Verse 35, and on that day, what day? The day that he had been teaching and had been teaching in parables and had been teaching and preaching all day and Teaching and preaching can zap you of strength, and it's emotionally draining, and Jesus was, and physically draining, and Jesus was tired, and he uh, said, let us go over to the other side. At the end of that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Matthew <clears throat> puts it this way, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side. And then, <clears throat> as we read in our story, Jesus went to sleep in the back of the boat because he was tired. And so here you have the Lord commanding the disciples to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is, uh, uh, they call it the Sea of Galilee, it's a lake. <clears throat> it is, uh, it's about eight miles wide and about 13 miles long, and it's uh, 680 feet below sea level, <clears throat> very, very low, and it's surrounded by some mountains that are as high as 2,000 feet. So when you have uh, a very low-lying area that's going to be uh, semi-tropical and it's going to have warm air associated with it, uh, right next to a, an area that has cold air associated with it, the top of the mountains, when those come together, you can create some violent winds and some uh, difficult situations on the Sea of Galilee. And the way that the wind blows naturally through those mountains, it just can whip that thing up in a, in a short period of time. The Sea of Galilee at its deepest point is only 200 feet deep. So when you take a body of water that's not relatively not all that deep and you start hitting it with a lot of wind, you can create a severe, severe storm. And that's what they were in. It was a severe storm. Warren Wiersbe says in his commentary that he was on the Sea of Galilee and he was talking to uh, the, the guy that was running the boat that he was on. And he asked that man, he said, have you ever been in a storm on the Sea of Galilee? And he said, that man's eyes got really big and he said, one time. And I hope I never experience that again. Tremendous fear when you're in this huge storm on the Sea of Galilee. Well, these guys were in a storm, a terrible storm, and Jesus had told them, <clears throat> we're going over to the other side. He didn't say, guys, we're gonna get in the boat, we're gonna hit a storm, and we're going down. He didn't say we're going under, he said we're going over, we're going over to the other side. Now listen, when you are in a storm, and a big, big problem comes and plants itself right in your lap, what do you do? You remember what the Lord has said. You remember what the Lord has promised. And you put your trust in the Lord's word. And you cling to the Lord. We were singing today about coming to the Lord and coming to the king. What some people do when they're in difficulties, they, they run from the Lord. They get mad at God. No, you don't need to run from him. You need to run to him. And you need to take the promises of God and cling to those promises. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The God who promised is faithful. And if we remain faithless, or if we are faithless, the scripture says, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 
And all of us could give a testimony of times where we were so faithless, but God remained faithful. And his word is true. And here's what the Lord wants us to do. When we're in the thick of the storm, he wants us to cling to his word. The disciples should have said, hey, it is scary and the waves are coming in and this, is, this looks bad for us and it's the middle of the night, it's the fourth watch of the night, the, probably th three or four o'clock in the morning and uh, darkest part of the night and it's looking terrible and what are we gonna do? Didn't he say that we were going over to the other side? Let's just keep rowing and keep bailing and trust him and trust what he told us. You know, after all, this was all about faith. Oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Where is your faith? It's all about faith. I heard about a lady, you may have heard this story. I heard it years and years ago. She was a, a little widow and she was very destitute. And, uh, and poor, and one day she looked, and there were, she just didn't have any food. There was no food in the house, and she didn't have any money. To, she wasn't gonna get paid for another week or so, and so she didn't have any food, and she didn't know what to do. So what did she do? She was in a storm, and she came before the Lord, and she said, Lord, she said, I don't have anything to eat. I don't have any food in the house, but you promised in your word, Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You promised you would meet my needs, God. And I'm walking with you and I'm trusting you and I'm claiming your word and I'm claiming your promises. And she was praying and she was praying so loudly that her landlord who lived on the other side of her could hear her because the walls, it was a, a cheap apartment and the walls were pretty thin. He could hear her. Now the landlord was a man who didn't have any use for God. Maybe not an atheist, but surely a, a strong agnostic, doubted the existence of God and couldn't stand uh, for people to talk to him about God, and, and he heard her praying. Well, after her prayer, she went out. She had some things to do, and she went out, and that man thought to himself, I'm gonna fix this lady's wagon. And so he went to the store, and he bought two big bags of groceries. He had a key to her apartment because he was the landlord. He opened the door to her apartment and he put those bags on her table and then he left her apartment, locked it back up and left. Well, she comes home and she, she opens the door and she sees on her kitchen table two uh, large grocery sacks full of groceries and she says, praise God, Lord, you answered my prayer just like you said. I cling to your word and you, you answered it and you met my need. And then she immediately thought of her landlord and she said, this is a testimony. And so she went over to his uh, apartment. She knocked on the door. She said, you, you come over here with me. She said, I want you to see something. She said, you say there is no God you say God is not real. You say God doesn't answer prayer. She said, I didn't have any groceries, and I prayed, and I claimed the scripture, and I asked God for groceries, and look what he did. And he looked at her, and he just said, lady, you're so stupid. That's just like a Christian. He said, I heard you praying. I heard what you were asking for. He said, I went to the store. I bought those groceries. Those groceries didn't come from God. They came from me. She said, you're wrong, mister. God gave me those groceries, even if he sent them by the devil. <laughs> I love that story because that's a woman who just claimed the promises of God and she wasn't gonna let go. Listen, God loves it when we do that. So when you're in your storm, you cling to the promises of God. Let us uh, hold fast the confession of our faith, with, uh, of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. Hey, you can do that. You can trust in the Lord's word. Second thing you can do, you can relax in the Lord's presence. Now, what does it say? Verse 36, verse 36, and leaving the multitude, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. Verse 38, and he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. The Lord is in the disciples' boat. Now, you say, oh, he's in the boat, but he's asleep in the boat. Yeah, shows the humanity of Jesus. The real Jesus is human. He's divine and he's human. He's the God-man. As much God as though he were not man at all, as much man as though he were not God at all. 
and the humanity of Jesus, he's worn out from ministering and preaching and teaching all day, and so he goes to sleep in the back of the boat. And it, and it shows the humanity and also shows the fact that Jesus is totally calm. He's totally at peace. He's not freaked out by the storm. Didn't catch him by surprise. He knows all things, but he's also fine in the storm. He's asleep in the storm because he's at peace, perfect peace. And the storm is no sweat to him. It's no worry to him. It's no problem to him, and it shouldn't have been to them. Well, you say, well, yeah, it should have been to them. No, this is why it shouldn't have been. Your troubles cannot drown you when Jesus is in your boat. That storm couldn't drown them when the Son of God was in their boat. And so they could have just said, hey, this looks bad, but hey, we walk by faith and not by sight. And what did he tell us to do? He told us we were going over to the other side. So, hey, John, you keep bailing, and, and uh, James, you keep rowing. I mean, that's what they needed to do. And they didn't need to freak out like they did. They could relax in the Lord's presence. You know, the scripture talks about a peace that surpasses understanding, that surpasses comprehension, the peace of God. And when we go through a terrible, terrible storm and we still have peace, what a testimony. How does that happen? It happens when you understand that the Lord is with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. And his rod and his staff, they comfort me. When Debbie and I were in seminary at Southeastern Seminary, we took the girls, obviously, when we moved. They came with us. And uh, nine, seven, and five. And Debbie got a job um, after a few months, she got a job working at the Baptist bookstore. And at the Baptist bookstore, uh, they paid her a whopping $5 an hour. And, uh, but she liked the job, and it was fun, and it was in walking distance. And uh, one of the perks that you got at the Baptist bookstore at Southeastern Seminary was they would give you free uh, video rentals. That was back in the day where you had video rentals. And uh, they didn't cost anything. So I said, man, this is great. And so every Friday night was movie night with uh, Debbie and the girls and me. And so I was looking at movies, and I found um, the Left Behind, not, not Left Behind, A Thief in the Night. It was made in 1972, and I had remembered, or somewhere in the 70s, I had remembered, oh, man, this is really good. It's about the rapture. Girls, you're going to love this. It's about the rapture. And so I rented A Thief in the Night for movie night. And uh, there's no warning label on The Thief in the Night, because it's pretty intense. And uh, some of you have seen it. You know, all of a sudden, uh, people just get raptured, and they show this guy shaving, and all of a sudden, the Lord comes, and it's just his shaver in the sink buzzing, and uh, people are screaming because folks are gone, and, and then it goes into the, the Antichrist coming, and he's beheading people. And so the, the kids, they're nine, seven, and five. They're watching this. And finally, Jill was like, please, can we turn this off? You know, I just hate this. And so I was like, well, I thought it was pretty good. And it uh, didn't dawn on me, it's too intense. So we shut it off, and we retire for the night. And uh, they were down for probably, I don't know, an hour and a half. And then standing by my bed uh, is Jill. And she's nine years old, and she looks at me, and she goes, I'm freaked out by that movie. I can't sleep. And I'm not sleeping upstairs, and it's too scary. And so I said, all right, well, come in here with me. And so she's in bed with me, and we try and go back to sleep. And then I hear this sick little cry from upstairs bedroom. Now, Jill and Sarah shared a room, and Amy had her own room. She's the middle daughter. I don't know how she worked that out, but somehow she finagled her own room. So she was fine, uh, but, but Jill and Sarah sh shared a bedroom, and so when Jill came down, Sarah was by herself. So I hear this sick little cry coming from Sarah. I, I thought, maybe I'm dreaming this. It was just, Daddy. <laughs> like, what is that? So I waited a little bit. Daddy. About three or four times. So finally, I was like, all right, I'm getting up. I go up there. I walk into the room. I said, Sarah, what is it? She said, Daddy, Jill's gone. <laughs> I said, Jill's not gone. She's downstairs in my bed. 
So well, I'm not sleeping up here by myself. <laughs> so I was like, all right, come down too. And so it was just a, a love fest there in this small bed, you know, all of us in there. And, but you know what, I, I, I've never forgotten this, and Sarah especially, when she would come and when she was scared. You know, here was the deal in our family. If you're sick, you go to mom's side of the bed. If you're scared, you go to dad's side of the bed. <laughs> it's a good deal for me, I like that. I'll take fear over vomit any day of the week. <laughs> but Sarah, whenever she would come to my side of the bed and she had had a bad dream and she was scared, and I said, well, come in here, and I'd open up the covers and she'd come in and I'd put my arms around her and her little five, six-year-old frame, she would just relax. She, you could just feel it in her body. She was just like, <sighs> you know, the bad guy's not gonna get me because my dad has me and my dad is gonna protect me, and I'm in the presence of my dad. Hey, you can relax in the Lord's presence. You can let the wind blow and let the storm howl and let the waves crash, but you can be at peace with the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 10, a verse that many of us are familiar with, be still and know that I am God. Be still in the New American Standard says, cease striving and know that I am God. And the Amplified says, let go, relax, and know that I am God. And so I can just relax. God's in charge. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't need to fear any evil. Why? Because he is with me. It says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And even in the midst of the worst trial, the worst storm, the worst fiery furnace, you can know that the Lord will be there. When Nebuchadnezzar took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and brought them to himself and says, hey, I told everybody to bow down when I struck up the band. I have this image, and you have to bow down, and they tell me you're not bowing down, so I give you one more chance. You bow down to my image. And they said, we don't need another chance, king. We're not gonna bow down. He said, well, then I'm gonna throw you in the fiery furnace, and what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? They said, our God is able to deliver us from your hand, and he will deliver us from your hand, but let it be known, even if he doesn't, we're not gonna bow down, we're gonna serve God. And Nebuchadnezzar got so mad, and he said, heat up the furnace seven times hotter, so they heated it up seven times hotter. And he said, bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with ropes, and they did. And they said, throw them into the furnace, and they threw them into the furnace, and the furnace was so hot that the poor slobs that threw them in, they were consumed in the flames. And then Nebuchadnezzar looked in the furnace, and he said, did we not throw three men in the furnace? And all his suck-up attendants said, certainly, O king. And he said, but I see four men loosed and walking about and the fourth is like the son of God. When you go through the hard times, when you go through the storms, when you go through the trouble and the fiery furnace, the Lord is there with you and you can relax in his presence. Third thing you can do, you can rest in the Lord's love. So here's the situation. The water is coming in and it just came upon him out of nowhere and it's at night on the Sea of Galilee, and they're in not a very big boat. If you ever go to, to uh, the Holy Land, they wanna take you to the Jesus boat, which is a boat that they found uh, during the time period of the first century, and they say this is, a, this is about the size of the boat that Jesus would have been in. Not a big boat, especially for uh, 13 people. And so, they were in this little boat and they're trying to sail across and the wind is blowing and the water is whipping and it's coming into the boat and they can't bail it out fast enough and the boat is filling up and they think they're going to die. These are experienced fishermen, but they think this is the worst storm that I've ever been a part of and I don't think we're gonna make it and here is Jesus, he's asleep 
He's the rock of ages. He sleeps like a rock. You'd have to sleep through like a rock if you're gonna sleep through a storm like that. He's asleep. And so they're like, well, I think we better wake him up. And so it's probably Peter that woke him up. He always was kind of volunteered for the dumb stuff. And so he comes back there and he wakes him up and he says to him, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you even care? We're about ready to die and you're asleep. Don't you even care? When you go through a terrible storm in your life, it's easy to ask the Lord, God, don't you care about me? Don't you even care about me? It's a common question. I think when we ask that question, even though it's a common question, even though it's a pretty natural question, it's almost like balling up your fist and punching the Lord in the heart. The Lord is saying, you're asking, you're asking me if I care for you. You're asking me, do I not even care for you? He said, do you see my hands? Big nail scars in his hands where he took the nails for you. He shows you his feet, big holes in his feet. You see my feet? where I took the nails for you, he pulls up his shirt. He shows you his wounded side where they thrust that spear and the blood and the water flowed. He said, do you see this? Do you see all my scars? I did it all because I care for you. Because I don't want you to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I did that all because I care so much for you. The scripture says that we can be assured of God's love and God's care for us. You know how much the Lord loves you? This is mind-blowing. How much does the Father love little old you and little old me? John chapter 17, verse 23, Jesus said this, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. How much does God love you as much as he loves Jesus? That's what Jesus said. How much does Jesus love you? John chapter 15, verse nine, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Stay in my love. Remain in my love. Hey, we could say rest in my love. And when you're going through a terrible, horrible storm in life, you can rest in the Lord's love. You can know that you know that you know that you know that he loves you. And the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your cares, your anxieties upon him. Why? How? Because he cares for you. It matters to him concerning you. Anything you go through in life, it matters to God because he loves you. He loves you. Now, the common question is this. If God loves me so much, he cares so much, then I don't understand why he's not doing something in my situation. Why is he asleep when I am about ready to go under? That's a good question. Good question. That's a question we have, especially during the hard times, especially when it seems like the Lord is not uh, really interested in what's going on with us when it seems like he's asleep in our boat. And, and the way you answer that question, why is God not doing in our life? I think it's best answered through the life of Job. Job, who was a man who loved God with all his heart. Job walked with God. There was no one like Job in the face of the whole earth. He's blameless in all his ways. But then the devil said to God, God, the only reason Job serves you is because you bless him. Lord, you quit blessing him, and he'll curse you to your face. And so God allowed the devil to get at Job. He let down the hedge of protection on Job's life, and Job lost his fortune. He lost his family, all 10 of his children. He lost his physical health. He was covered in sore boils from the 
top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And then he lost his face, face in the community. Job said, the lowest of the low now spit in my face. They treat me like I'm a piece of garbage. Job lost everything, and Job asked God, why? Why, why, why? Chapter three in the book of Job, five times. Why, 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 why? It's a natural question, why? And you know what you find in the book of Job? God never answers Job's why. God is not in the business of explaining. He's in the business of sustaining. And I think the reason why God doesn't answer us when we're like, why, Lord, is this happening in my life? is because God said, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. If I explained it to you, you wouldn't understand it. You go home and uh, to uh, your two or three-year-old and try and explain quantum physics to them. See how much they're going to get. They don't understand that. God is God, and we're down here. And God says, you don't understand what I'm doing, and I can't explain to you what I'm doing, so I just tell you to trust me. Trust me. And Job chapter 13, verse 15, greatest verse in the book of Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And Job trusted God, and Job found that God was trustworthy. Babby Mason sings that song. When you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart because he loves you. He loves you. Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't ask God that. Say, Lord, I thank you that you care for me, and I cast this care and this burden and this fear and this problem and this storm, I cast it upon you. You can rest in the Lord's love, and lastly, you can rejoice in the Lord's power. So what happens in this little story, in this situation, this real-life situation? Well, they wake up Jesus, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, what does he do? He goes from the back of the boat to the front of the boat, and he says, hush, be still. And immediately, the wind stopped, and the waves stopped. Now, it's one thing for the wind to stop, but it's another thing for the waves to stop. Because we know that once the water gets going, it doesn't just go from uh, going into the boat, coming at you at a, at a hard pace, to stopping. It doesn't do that. But it does when the Lord says it. It does when the Lord rebukes the wind and the waves. It does when the Lord says, hush, be still. And all of a sudden, everything was just perfectly calm. Whoa. And then what does he do? Then he looks back at the guys and he says, why are you so timid? Why are you shaking? Why are you thinking you're gonna die? Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Man, you mean this whole thing was a test of faith? Yes, it was a test of faith. Storms, the Lord uses them to test our faith. Jesus had been teaching all day and these guys were privy to hear him teach and then all of a sudden, just like any teacher, we're gonna teach and then we're gonna take a test and this was a pop quiz because they didn't know it was coming but the Lord knew it was coming and they didn't do well on the test. Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Well, what was the faith response? He said, let us go over to the other side. Faith is trusting God's word and believing what God says. And if he says we're going over to the other side, we're going over to the other side. He didn't say we're going under. He said we're going over. And that is faith. And the faith response in this situation is you keep rowing the dumb boat. And you just trust that the Lord is going to see you through. He uses storms to test our faith. Listen, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. If you have a faith that has never been tested, how do you know that you can count on it. Andre Crouch used to sing that song, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. Faith is a lot like a muscle. And if you're gonna get big muscles, you don't get big muscles by sitting on the couch, eating more bluebell. 
You know, you say, well, I'm doing curls. That doesn't, no, that doesn't work. You got to do curls like this. And then when you test your muscles, then your muscles get stronger. When your faith is tested, your faith gets stronger. So God uses storms to test our faith, and he uses storms to show us that he is able. In any and every situation, he is able. Now, this is wild. Verse 41, and they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? These guys had been with Jesus. They had seen him cast out demons. They have seen Jesus cleanse the leper. They have seen Jesus forgive sins. They have seen Jesus perform miracles of healing. They have even seen Jesus raise a man from the dead, the widow from Nain, her son. He raised him from the dead. You would think, man, that's this Jesus, we believe Jesus can do anything. But they had never seen him calm the sea. They had never seen him tell wind and water to stop. Silence. You just right where in your tracks, you just stop right there. And that's what the water did. Just okay. Just stopped. And they're they're blown, their minds are blown. They're like, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? They grew in their understanding of his ability and of his power. And see, God uses difficulties in our lives so that we would grow in our, uh, in our faith and in our understanding that God is able in this situation. In 2005, the Lord led me to start From His Heart Ministries, the radio and television ministry of the pulpit of our church, just the sermons from our church. And the Lord led me to do that. And two guys, he put it upon their hearts to give me a total of $35,000 to start the ministry. This is separate from First Baptist Church, so it's not a burden on the finances of First Baptist Church. So we started up. And I was feeling pretty good. We have $35,000. I went to my first National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Los Angeles in 2005, February 2005. And I was feeling like, Man, we're, we're doing so good. God has so blessed us. We got 35,000. I had enough to pay for, for airtime uh, once a week on this one station and a little bit for a website and some others, you know, money's just to do a little bit of this and that and uh, with the ministry. And I, I remember at my first meeting uh, at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, it became pretty uh, apparent that this was gonna cost a whole lot more money than I thought. And I remember asking my friend Carl Townsend, who had been in that business for a long, long time, I said, Carl, I was thinking 35,000 was pretty good to start off. Well, what do you think? He said, well, in order to do this, you need to have about $500,000. I said, how much? He said, 500,000. So well, that's a lot. Oh, I don't have that much. I'm never gonna have that much. I remember going home just thinking, there's no way this is gonna work, Lord. There's no way that I can raise $500,000. And and right at the beginning of the ministry, I was ready to throw in the towel. And the Lord convicted me and said, you know, I guess I'm a pretty small God to you. I I guess I'm the God of 35,000, but can't be the God of 500,000. I mean, what's 500,000 to God? It's nothing, nothing to God. It's huge to me. But it's nothing to God, and God really convicted me. He says, you're walking by sight and not by faith. Why don't you trust me? Why don't you believe me for something big? So I said, all right, Lord, I apologize. I'm sorry. Forgive me for, for thinking so small. And I, I don't know where that money's gonna come from. It was about two weeks later, I got a check in the mail, unsolicited. Hadn't talked to this person at all about this. He gave me a check for $100,000. About a month later, I got another check for $100,000. About six months later, I got another check for $100,000. And the Lord was saying, you don't think I can do this? I can do this. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you, you just need to say, I've been thinking too small with what God can do. I need to start expanding my 
horizons. The scripture says, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory. He is able to do all things so you and I can rejoice in the Lord's power. Now I wanna show you one last thing and we'll be done. There is a key word in this passage. It's the Greek word megas, M-E-G-A-S. It doesn't show up, obviously, in the English translation. But it's used to describe the wind in verse 37. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, a megas gale of wind. Megas means great. A megas gale of wind. And then it's used to describe the calm that came in verse 39. When he said, hush, be still, the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. It became megas calm, a great calm. And then it's used in verse 41 where it says they became very much afraid. Uh, that's a megas fear, a megas awe. Megas, megas, megas. What is the message there? The message is this. There are great storms in life that you're gonna face and I'm gonna face. But there is a Savior who can speak a word to your great storm to bring about a great calm, to produce in you a great awe so that you might realize that he indeed is the great God who can do anything in your life. And the question is this, will you trust him? My friend, what have you done with the real Jesus? The Bible tells us he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he stands at the door and he knocks. So here's the question. Have you opened the door, the door of your heart to him in repentance and faith? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again from the dead. I believe you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And right now, Jesus, I turn my life over to you. I surrender all to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. Find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.